talking about this. No, 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 I'm not. After the show, we're talking about things because there's an after show. Did you know that? There is an after show. There's an after after show also mm, where the hosts can know. talk about <laughs> things. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, this is This Week in Science, and we have made it in the nick of time to do our live broadcast of the Twist podcast with all of the hosts for the first time in a couple of weeks, which is very exciting. I think we're all very happy to have Blair back. I'm happy to have me back, too. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> yes, Daniel Yount, we want science. And Paul Disney, we want it peer-reviewed. And so that's what we're going to be talking about on the episode tonight. We've got lots of stories, peer-reviewed and otherwise. The show is about to begin. Are you ready to start-ish, Justin? Do you have a disclaimer? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay. So, we can start this show, which is the live broadcast and not the actual end podcast. The end podcast is its own little th edited version of this live thing that yeah, we do. Yeah, and it's not called the end podcast. That's no, a different podcast. It's, it's this, this week, week in science. science. Wherever you look for it. There we are. This is not the end. This is the beginning Starting in a nice little, oops, let's see if I can pull my, there we go. Starting in a three, two, this is Twist. This Week in Science, episode, 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 episode. Yep, it's right there. That's this type of show today. Starting again in three, two, this is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 831, recorded on June 30th, 2021. How hot can it get? Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on the show, we will fill your heads with heat, heads, and hope, but first. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Everything, and I do mean everything, is more complicated than you think it is. It's comfortable to know things, to put them in boxes of identifiable categories and say, this is this, that is that. And eh, it pretty much works. The more we simplify and the more confident we are at it. So it's kind of hard to say that uh, there's anything wrong with this strategy because it works for pretty much everything that we know. But lest we forget, here's a quick reminder. All the things we put into boxes are not actually in those boxes. Reality is complicated, and every slice of the complicated is itself complex. And within the complex slice of complicated, there are nuances from which new complications can arise. And even when we get to the point where we are truly understanding an aspect of a nuance from a complex slice of the complicated, we remember that it's all connected in ways we barely comprehend. And this realization should serve as a reminder that whenever you hear a very simple answer to any question, chances are it is either mostly incorrect or another episode of This Week in Science coming up next. The kind of mind that can't get enough I wanna learn everything I wanna fill it all up With new discoveries that happen Every day of the week There's only one place to go To find the knowledge I seek I wanna know what's happening What's happening What's happening This week in science What's happening What's happening What's happening This week in science Good Science to you, Kiki. Oh, and Blair's back! Hello! <laughs> we missed you, Blair. I missed you. I'm so happy to be back. So excited that you are back again, Blair. Welcome back! Thanks. I had to take the animal quarter back from Justin, so it was out of my hands. <laughs> you better. <laughs> and we have a good episode with Blair's Animal Corner right where it should be. 
in the corner. No. <laughs> Coming up, I have episode... I don't know why I keep saying episode today. This is the word I say. We have lots of great stories. I have stories about... Hmm. Brains, because I love the brains coming up at the end of the show. I've got some hope for malaria, maybe, and also a little bit of neutron star eating. Oh, and it's hot. Mm, yeah. Yes. I heard you it's hot Justin? up there in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> hot. It's been. Yes, it's better, but it's been. Justin, what do you have? I've got not one, but two ancient, archaic, human evolution findings stories. Uh, this week, uh, glow in the dark mRNA, Ooh. and guess who loves global warming? It's not gonna be snakes. me. It's going to be snakes. <laughs> it's about snakes liking global warming. Oh, Blair, what's in the animal corner? Oh, I have a story about snakes too, but this is about uh, spiders that eat snakes. Um, I also have. <laughs> wait. Um, wait, 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 wait. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I have to yeah. correct you. You yeah. misspoke. Yeah. Your 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 story is about. Snakes that like to eat spiders, but you incorrect. unfortunately inc- no. Incorrect. What? We'll get there. Um, <laughs> also, <laughs> I have a story about mantids that that take a a, a doom filled dip, and I also have hot birds. Hot birds. Let's mm-hmm. tweet about it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Anyway. It is time for the show, but before we get started, I do want to let you all know that if you have not yet subscribed to This Week in Science, you can do that all places that podcasts are found. Look for This Week in Science twists. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, Instagram, Twitter. We we are Twist Science in some places, so search for Twist Science if you don't find us under This Week in Science. And our website is twist.org. All right, let's dig in to the heat, to the hotness. It's getting hot hot in here. How How hot hot is it? it? It's so hot. Man, it's it's been breaking records right and left. And if anybody out there has been keeping track of what has been going on, it is a once in a millennial millennium event. Not a millennial. Once in a millennial. That's like. That, I, that's got to be a movie. Once in a millennium event. And as we've talked about, so many of these hurricanes her- occurring in other places around the world, heat waves and droughts are also extreme weather events that occur more often thanks to climate change. And so we've got record temperatures, we've got fires, we've got permafrost melt. Hey, Siberia, what's going on there? Uh, And these are just a few of the predictions that are coming true sooner than expected because of our warming climate. And the big question is, will this once in a millennia event in the Pacific Northwest and actually across the entire West, will it happen more often? Will heat domes that cause temperatures ground temperatures like the one reached in Washington state of 145 degrees Fahrenheit to be reached more often. Normally, the temperature is what's called a dry bulb temperature. You have a thermometer that is a few feet, four or five feet above the ground. It's testing the air temperature. It's not touching the ground. It's not going to take uh, be influenced by concrete or the ground temperature itself emanating the heat. So they've got it high enough up that hopefully it's just a measure of air temperature. We hit temperatures in Portland, Oregon of 116 degrees Fahrenheit. Temperatures were reached what? the hottest temperature in the Pacific Northwest was reached at about, I think it was 123 degrees Fahrenheit. So that is that in is, British Columbia. That is Death Valley uh, yes. desert hot temperatures. Yes, these You're are not temperatures supposed to ever get those there. No, and the infrastructure is not built to deal with these temperatures. Oh so we also no had buckling roads, oh, and wow. um, yeah, there are stories of you know Siberian permafrost melting and how that's going to impact buildings in Siberia in Russia. Oh, how it will yes. affect the railroads. How it will affect the the roadways 
But we often here in America think of, that's a far off Siberian tundra. That's not here. It's not in it's America. Canadian problems. It's a Canadian problem. <laughs> well, no, it's also an American problem. <laughs> I'll tell you what else is an American problem is wildfires, specifically yes. on the West Coast here. And uh, with the extremely dry winter that we had and now with these temperatures. Oh, and it's um, a holiday this weekend where people like to set things on fire. I have concerns. <laughs> so, I think so we all thank you to our friends at We Have Concerns. But yes, we have concerns. <laughs> one of the things that we have brought up on the show a few times is the fact that there is a difference between weather and climate. Uh, and yep. not to send people somewhere else, but uh, Catherine Hayho at Hayho Hayho uh, has a piece out that she's got on the Twitter climate versus weather. I think it's also on YouTube. I think it's NPR. Uh, built space, but it's a, it gives a very nice sort of update to the concept of weather versus climate, because it's used it's used on both. Uh, you know, whether you're believing in science or you're denying science, people point to weather to deny uh, climate change, and then people who believe in climate change will attribute everything to it, even when it's just weather. But the sort of interesting thing that gets pointed out is that record breaking temperature is actually kind of a normal thing. It happens across our country every year. It's the coldest day, it's the hottest day it'll happen. What's different <laughs> and, and is available in that data is the number of hot days that are records <laughs> increasing, while the number of cold days, they're showing up still in smaller numbers, but they're showing up in new places where they weren't having as many. So it is, again, and complicated. <laughs> Yeah, it's complicated. And the one of the issues that we that came up here is that, yeah, OK, it was a hot day, 116 degrees, but it cools off at night, right? You'll cool down at night. That didn't happen. Temperatures were above 70 degrees all night long, which that's the normal. That's high, 70 degrees like is high higher than the Portland. average temperature for June in Portland, Oregon. So yeah. so what we're experiencing is the kind of weather that is made possible because of a change in threshold due to climate change. But we have this change in weather that results in higher daytime temperatures and also higher nighttime temperatures. And life has a hard time rebounding when those temperatures don't drop at night. So lots of things to talk about here and to consider. But I just, yeah, Blair, you brought up the big point at this weekend in the United States is a big weekend for fireworks and explosives and incendiary devices. Wait, and if whoa, you whoa, are whoa. in We're not the still West, doing that, are we? No. Well, if yeah. you are uh, in the West, man. please refrain. Yes. Leave it to <laughs> the professionals. You Let don't want to be the do person. A fireworks thing. <laughs> Watch it. <laughs> don't set off neighborhood fireworks. Just don't. You don't want to be the reason. Yes. That all of California or Oregon or Washington goes up in a giant because yep. everything's so dry and hot. Yep. Don't be the next cause of an Eagle Creek fire. All right. But anyway, everyone, stay well, stay cool. Let's try and avoid having other places around the world become like Jacobabad, Pakistan, where the temperatures reach above 50 degrees Celsius on a regular basis in the summertime with humidity and get higher than is possible for the human body to survive. Wow. We don't want that to happen anywhere else. We don't even want it to happen there. So climate change is a big part of it and we need to start making our moves with organizations that can help make changes. Talk to your legislators. This is a science and policy issue. Regulations and corporate incentives can help make a huge difference in what happens down the road. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all, and what, one other thing I want to mention is that you just said the, the roads are buckling because yep. of heat. Yep. So here's the proof the written out very obvious proof that climate change consideration is infrastructure. <laughs> and yep. so when we talk about infrastructure funding through the government and you want to separate it out from this divisive thing called climate change, we don't want to talk about it. This is part of infrastructure. It has to be part of the conversation. It has and we're to be. 
around the country dealing with aging infrastructure that was potentially not, it was not created. It was 60, 70, 80 years ago was possibly built, not with these extreme weather events in mind. So there's a lot that needs to be great point, Blair. All right, Justin, we're using our big brains to tell everybody about, you know, what's happening here. But did you find a brain or a skull, a cranium? So uh, I didn't find it, but there has been a new human skull found in China. Uh, It's a new human. It's got its own species and everything, but it might not be a new species, but it might be. As the story goes so far, uh, skull was discovered back in the 1930s in Harbin City uh, in China. Uh, At the time, the man who found it thought it might be special, but decided to wrap it up and toss it into a well. Because that's what you do. Also, they were under Japanese occupation and uh, thought that turning it over would uh, disappear it from from, uh, from anybody's ability to appreciate this thing. So... On uh, this the gentleman's I'm deathbed, ju- as the story goes, <laughs> I'm just I'm just gonna hide it from everyone. Just I but, found this thing and I'm hiding it. <laughs> Timmy fell down a well. Forgot about it for like a couple generations. On well, the he deathbed, had a lot going on. I'm sure. <laughs> on the deathbed, tells the grandchildren. Oh, by the way, uh, the well we've been drinking out of all these years. Yeah, I might have thrown a skull uh, in it some 80, 90 years ago. So anyway, 2018. Uh, children find this, grandchildren find this, they turn it over to paleoanthropologists, and it turns out it is the largest ever homo skull ever found. It's also one of the most complete skulls in the record, uh, and as big as that is, it's uh, even going to be probably a little bit bigger of a con- controversy, I guess. it's. I'm sort of hedging whether it's a, going to be a controversy or it's just science going to do its due diligence, but... Chinese scientists are saying the skull represents a newly discovered human species named Homo Longi, or Dragon Man. Which, I appreciate the Dragon Man is the cooler name, so I'm already voting to to go with that no matter what. Uh, But is it new? Or is it the first skull of a Denisovan ever found? That's what the conversation is going to be about going forward. Previously discovered hominin known just by the finger bone and a partial mandible... I think there's a little bit of a skull cap out there, too. But lots of genetic information. We got DNA from the toe. I think we got it from the jaw as well. And we have tracked Denisovans through peoples of Southeast Asia who have Denisovan ancestry. So there's also something called Homo uh, daliensis that's in the region, which is another ancient human. So that's another thread to be pulling on there. Two things to keep in mind. One... The controversy is totally meaningless. It doesn't matter what the thing is called at this point. Right now, it does not matter. What we need to just do is study the thing. Two, it's really cool. So some of the the findings of this skull is that it looks, it's definitely not human, but it has features that are much more current modern human than maybe we would have expected if it is a Denise thing. Uh, says researcher Quang Ji, professor of paleontology, Hebei Jio University. This fossil preserved many morphological details that are critical for understanding the evolution of, homo, of the Homo genius and the origin of Homo sapiens. Which, again, eh, origin of Homo sapiens. It's being almost looked at as like an ancestor. There's some claims that it's more of an ancestor to modern humans than Neanderthal. All of this is morphology. There is no DNA extracted at this point. It's possibly there, but they haven't done it. Uh, so, and even if it if it shows up and it is a Denisovan, uh, it's not going to be a human ancestor. There is ancestry for modern humans that have some of this, so it is some of our ancestry, as Neanderthal is. But you know, it's the braided stream all all the way throughout all of this this conversation. So this this head is big, though, you're saying. It's a big head. It's a big head, which kind of, they're saying, matches up with that big jaw bone or mandible that uh, they, partial mandible that they found in Tibet. Because so, how tall are Denisovans? They're, they're shorter than us, right? Well, we don't know. Maybe, that. maybe not. Yeah. Mm. That's the thing. With this big skull, the biggest homo skull ever found, there is some desire to call it taller or bigger. Right, more robust. But they could also just have big heads. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, 
So Neanderthal has a little bit larger cranium than a current modern human, but they weren't thought to be exceptionally tall. They were thought to be sort of stocky. Uh, and are not thought to be, but the, we found skeletons. We have, we've put the pieces together and we can tell they're not giants. So there's, you know, there's a lot of, this is some more quote here. Like Homo sapiens, they hunted mammals and birds and gathered fruits and vegetables and perhaps even caught fish. I don't know. I mean, you can learn a lot from a skull. I don't know. That there's a lot of stuff here that has me scratching their, my head about how the conclusions uh have been bridged from skull to everything else that's in this. Although, although actually, I'd have to take that back. One of the, uh, one of the, uh, no, I don't have to take it back. Actually, I'm going to keep it there. <laughs> I'll keep it right there because uh, there isn't any other information on this one about uh, uh, other tools or any artifacts that are associated with this because they don't have the site. Remember, this was found, and the location is being told where it's found is. Part of how they've also uh, traced it to being about 148,000 years old, at least, maybe older, because of the sediments that the the person who found it said he was digging out, I think, to make a bridge or something like this. He was, it was uh, a construction site. So they went and tested soil there. But this is, we are 90-ish years, 80, 90 years away from the discovery that wasn't really well documented. We have word of mouth stuff. So there's a lot of like, uh, this is a great, terrific, amazing find. And there's all this missing data that doesn't allow us to do what we would normally do if we had a find of this caliber. So more more to come out. But it does remind me, that earlier the, this year, I teased out uh, uh, a statement about by a bunch of people in the field who were saying there's big stuff coming right. in Asia that's going to change everything and hmm. this may be what was being hinted about uh, is this is this find yeah I mean what it comes back to though is you know if you come across something like this don't hide it and think about whether you should turn it over if you want to help the scientific community uh, then this kind of a, a find you have to be able to you stop you alert people. You let them. You let them assess the site. I mean, probably what happened is the skull was taken. Everything else was uh, excavated for the bridge or whatever, and a lot of other evidence was lost. Right. Um, however, but, however, I will say. Yeah. So part of this was this is in the 1930s, and it was very exciting time for for this is when I think this is like during Piltdown Man, but it's also Neanderthal discoveries were first emerging. Like it was kind of global news that there was this exciting past that was being found. Uh, and and it's just it's possible that by not turning over this skull that could have been a trophy or could have been destroyed or who knows what fate it had, just by accident I think it turned out okay. Mm -hmm. What <laughs> I want to know is in the nineteen thirties what kind of wrappings existed that maintained this thing at the bottom of a well for 90 years? Because yeah. they didn't have Ziploc bags. What? <laughs> I don't Timmy's think in the well. I don't know. I just want to make really bad, ta poor taste jokes about things in wells. But anyway, let's move away from this amazing find that may have big implications. We might we'll have see. a piece of in skull. There's yeah. a big maybe. That's huge. And they might have maybe. something else. They well, gotta check know. the DNA. They gotta also, get why yeah. they should start there. The Zip morphology is huh? Ziploc bags, 1968, by the way. Yeah, yeah, so, no, it wasn't Ziploc. Uh, it was probably wrapped in cloth, but I'm guessing or because oil it skin. wasn't Could have been an oil skin. skin. I'm skin guessing skin. that it's because it didn't have uh access to oxygen if it's submerged. Uh it's in Maybe no they light just threw it in the well. Who knows? Wild. Just put it in a bucket, threw it in the well. All right. I want to know what else is down there. Like, this guy, this is, this I bet is there, safety deposit vault. I bet there are a bunch of spiders down there. Oh, Maybe for some sure. snakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, you know what's wild? Spiders eat snakes. Did you know this? What? No. Yeah, so spiders eat snakes. Now. <laughs> this, is, this is something that apparently the scientific community knew. Nobody told me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so spiders eat snakes. Um, and first you're thinking like big, big spiders, tiny, tiny snakes, right? No. 
so th this was specifically looking at what spiders eat snakes, what snakes they're eating, what their relative body sizes are, and where they live. Because this was a, um, a consolidated, analyzed study of snake eating spiders around the world. Around the world. Around the world. Can, this was. Can I guess? Can I guess? Is it what really, are you big, really big spiders and really small uh, small snakes? No, no. I just, I just said that's, that's not, it. That's not what it was. It's not. No. So, <laughs> so this is over three hundred reports all over the world. They eat snakes. Spiders eat snakes on every continent. Except for Antarctica. Shh. <laughs> Don't tell them. Um, because there's no spiders in Antarctica or snakes. Yeah, and no snakes. So it, it tracks. Um, but 80% of incidents were either in the U.S. or... Do you Australia. Think? Australia. You got it. You got it. You got it. Of course. Where all the terror animals are. <laughs> Um, in Europe, <laughs> hey, I, I can't wait to go to Australia one day. I'm obsessed with Australian animals overall, but they have a lot of deadly things, so I'm not surprised. Um, but in Europe, less than 1% of the reported incidents occurred, so there's not a lot going on in Europe with spider-eating snakes, and mostly it is some of those teeny tiny non-venomous snakes in the blind snake family. They look like giant worms, kind of. They're the ones being eaten by spiders. But... In Americas and Australia, um, they spiders. There are spiders from eleven different families catching and eating snakes. This is not an unusual thing that happens. So it's a it's a pretty diverse kind of uh, phylogeny of these spiders all over the world. And um, what they found was that overall, the spiders using the eating the bigger snakes had. No surprise, stronger venom. But specifically, it appeared venom that was good for us. <laughs> so stuff that could incapacitate or kill humans. Also helpful against snakes. Yeah, so, so the photo the photo that we got up right now. That makes is a lot of a sense. Black widow. Uh-huh. Uh taking out a scarlet snake. Yes. I've always had there. respect for black widows growing up in they're the Central Valley of and they're, California. Yeah, they're everywhere. They're in every garage. Terrified. In California. Yeah. They're a bit terrified much. of them. Yeah. Now um, even more. So spiders, these spiders, um, like I said, they were from they were uh, eleven different families. Um, they and they can outfight snakes from seven different families. So this is a pretty diverse response. And those snakes can be 10 to 30 times their size. Imagine taking something down and eating part of something 30 times your size. That would be one big That's pizza. Big yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so if, we're, if we're doing some rounding, I, I can do this in my head right now. So let's say a 200 pound mm. human, right? Times three is 600. So we're talking about a 6,000 pound animal. So we're talking like a rhinoceros. Like imagine hunting and eating part of a rhinoceros with like no tools. Pretty well. But um, I'm just going to bite you. Yeah. Anyway, the largest snakes caught by spiders were one meter in length. That's approximately three feet. That's a pretty, pretty standard size snake. Um, and on average, they were about 26 centimeters. So um, you can think about that as, as about 10 inches. Most of the snakes caught were very young. So that was the thing is they were young. They were fresh, freshly hatched snakes. They were perhaps foolhardy, not as good at getting away. And um, the, the venom from these spiders often were key. The, the black widows, brown widows, and um, the redbacks in Australia were all really good at doing this because they have that extremely strong neurotoxin, but also because they have very strong webs. And so there is some overlap here with the spiders that are dangerous to humans and the spiders that attack snakes. And so we think that that has something to do with the fact that the neurotoxins on vertebrates can be kind of catch all there's there's definitely a lot of overlap on what works on a snake and what works on a human because uh we have spinal cords and very similar nerve, nerve systems, systems yeah. right mm -hmm. yeah um and we, so we do have yeah we come from you know we, we come from similar a similar place we're all just fish <laughs> so when so you yeah. boil down when you look far you back go enough, back we're not that yeah. far back from each other okay so <laughs> so the one thing i have a couple of things i have too many things 
Uh, snakes, I know, eat insects, right? So snakes would typically be something that might hunt a spider. Yeah. I'm Not thinking, a lot. Okay, but yeah. But is this is this a defense mechanism or is this a hunting strategy? No, no, I they're think, eating. Yeah. They're they're chowing down on them. This is not like yeah. ah, you got too close, so I bite you, so I don't get disturbed. No, no, this, this is, is a really good question. So they'll catch a snake, and they will sit there and eat for hours to days. Wow. That being said, when they they abandon it while there's still some left, ants, wasps, flies, molds come and take the rest. But they do eat for hours to days. It's a community meal. It's a community yeah. food bank. <laughs> and these guys like snakes also. Interesting correlation between the two. They're very like boom and bust with their feeding strategy. So um, spiders can eat a lot and then not eat for a very long time. So can snakes. Very interesting. Um, so they obviously a lot more research is needed to find out what components of their venoms target vertebrate nervous systems, but they actually think this, uh, this initial study could help learn about those neurotoxins and help us with antivenoms for spider bites for humans. Um, and just understanding more about vertebrate nervous systems in general, because we also use venom sometimes to develop medicine, right? So all of that together means that this information kind of cataloging what spiders eat, what snakes could help with that a lot, because yeah. about 30% of the snakes that they attack are also venomous. So they, they can eat venomous snakes as well, which is just... My venom's better Wild. than your venom. Mm -hmm. So, oh, it, for right. example, back to Australia, brown snakes in the fa same family as cobras, considered one of the most venomous snakes in the world, <laughs> get eaten by redbacks, <laughs> which are Australian black widows. So, Delicious. Okay, so, so my new plan then for the perimeter fence of Science Island is to have it also be a black widow sanctuary. I don't know about that. <laughs> Feel like that might. That might I think that would. Either. I would choose. I would choose spider over snake. Oh, a so venomous spider over a venomous snake. Ooh, I would any not. Any day. I would any definitely day. not. You can. You can plop a, a snake in a cooler. You can pick it up with a big stick. You're pretty good. You can. I'm not getting anywhere near it. Spider. That's what I'm, I'm scared for. Of. Don't even worry about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm like, I got but. traumatized by one way. Yeah. <laughs> I've been traumatized by a rattlesnake. Speaking of things that like to eat other things, what about black holes? Not black widows, but even bigger objects. Yeah, black holes. They're just like, om nom nom, I want to eat everything. And we've talked previously about discoveries made by LIGO and Virgo, our gravitational wave detectors that have detected black holes merging with one another also detected neutron stars merging with one another, also det detected different sizes of black holes. And so there's all sorts of these new ideas like, ooh, there's a bunch of variety out there of things merging with other things. The one hypothetical situation that they had not yet discovered was a black hole eating a neutron star. <laughs> but now they have found it. They wow. have discovered, yes ripples in the gravitational waves that have jostled our planet gently in space-time using LIGO and Virgo together. They were able to detect two instances of black holes devouring neutron stars. Now, when we've previously seen a neutron star merger, there, was all, uh, there were detectors that detected the light that was emitted at the time of these st stars twirling together. And so there was a gamma ray burst that could give all sorts of information out at the same time. But, you know, for these, we weren't lucky enough yet that we know of to have captured any of the light frequencies uh, that would be indicative of what actually happened. So just dealing with gravitational wave analysis at this point in time. But these two things they have uh two signals the stronger signal triggered three all three lego virgo detectors on the 15th of january 2020 and it was a black hole that they estimate to be about the size mass mass of six suns oh it's a little baby one not too big 
It ate a neutron star that was only about a star and a half, a sun and a half in mass. Ah, so a baby, baby interaction. Very baby, yeah. And then 10 days prior to that, they found that they had seen other evidence of a nine solar mass black hole merging with a neutron star of 1.9 solar masses. These happened one billion light years ago. One million light years, one billion light years away. So, so These distant, that mean, like, ancient events. Does that mean wow. that the black hole is now the that many solar masses larger? Bigger. <laughs> yeah, so that's the question. How, what If it has the mass of the neutron star, is it just additive? I don't know the math that would... I think it just is. I think but that's, I think it I think should that's the be. the nice thing about gravity is just, it's you just add mass and that, that's it. And there it. you go. That's, yeah. It yeah, seems that that's how it should work. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, the uh, researchers are now... They're questioning whether or not black hole mergers, whether it's a black hole with a black hole or black hole with a neutron star, whether or not they always give off some kind of light emission, whether there's always some gamma ray burst or something. Um, And they've determined that black holes often rotate a lot more slowly than they expected them to. And it's the rotation of the black hole that determines how how quickly a neutron star gets devoured and how close it can get to the black hole before it gets devoured. Because if it's rotating really, really, really fast, it's just going to start ripping stuff together pretty quickly. Hmm. So anyway, they've discovered that according to their merger gravitational wave data, there are some very fast spinning black holes out there, but there are others that, and the majority of them they found so far, which is not many yet, to really base a universal standard on. But it seems as though a lot of them spin fairly slowly, much more slowly than originally anticipated. So now researchers are looking to hopefully find light from a black hole neutron star merger they haven't done yet. Yeah, fun (laughs) stuff. Okay, do you have another human? So, as if one ancient human ancestor, archaic human story, uh, wasn't enough, analysis of recently discovered fossils found in Israel suggest that interactions between different human species were even more complex than previously believed, unless you are a longtime listener to this show, in which case, you know it's pretty darn complex. Sorry, you're kind of used to it at this point. Uh, They are suggesting that at least some of the Neanderthals' ancestors came from the Levant. Research team led by Tel Aviv University published their findings in science are describing recently discovered fossils from a site called Nesher Ramla in Israel. Uh, This site dates to around 120 to 140,000 years ago. Fossils found by Dr. uh, Zaidner of the Hebrew University during excavations of Nesher Ramla, they were digging down eight meters. So they were way down deep. And they found large quantities of animal bones. Horses, deer, cows, stone tools, and lots of human bones. Human fossils consist of a partial cranial vault and a mandible. Researchers made some virtual reconstructions of the fossils to compare those with other fossils from Europe, Africa, Asia. The results suggest that the Nesher Ramla fossils represent late surviving populations of humans who lived in the Middle East during the Middle Pleistocene period. Uh, this is quoting Rolf Quam, who's a Bingham, uh, Binghamton University anthropology professor, who's also part of this. The oldest fossils that show Neanderthal features are found in Western Europe. So, researchers generally believe Neanderthals originated there. However, migrations of different species from the Middle East into Europe may have provided genetic contributions to Neanderthal gene pools during the course of their evolution. Other fossils from this approximate time period are difficult to classify taxonomically because they seem to be mixes of Neanderthal and modern human. This is one of the regions where we know humans and Neanderthals intermingled. But these fossils seem more Neanderthal-like in the mandibles and less Neanderthal-like in the cranial vault, uh, but both clearly distinct from modern humans. 
which is sort of, again, a pattern that's sort of been matching uh, both Neanderthals and humans, where uh, the diagnost uh, diagnostic skeletal features of each species uh, appear first in the facial region and then later on in the cranial vault. So we we change our face before our, our, our brain sack. <laughs> uh, describing the significance of the find, Dr. Hershkovitz said, it enables us to make a new sense of previously found, uh, make new sense of previously found human fossils, add another piece to the puzzle of human evolution and understand the migrations of humans in the old world, even though they lived so long ago. The researchers did not attribute the find at Nesharamla fossils to a new species. Rather, they grouped them together with all of those early old fossils at several sites that have been difficult to sort of classify because they're looking at admixtures of Neanderthal and current modern human, very likely. So uh, they're they're just they're just basically saying we found a melting pot of human and Neanderthal here in the Levant. Which makes sense. There would be a melting pot. There was overlap. This all makes sense, but there's yeah. There's overlap, and there's also a bottleneck, a uh, bottleneck of yeah. the Middle East between Africa, Asia, and Europe. That uh, it's, a, it's sitting in a, a, very, uh, a very good spot for, for different humans to have run into each other over, over right. the years. Yeah, it's cool. I love the virtual reconstruction stuff that they did trying to put together based on the because you all we always wonder it's like, okay, you have these bone fragments, how do you put together what the rest of the skull looks like? And so to create these virtual reconstructions, maybe they're starting to get there a little bit more. I know that's really interesting. I'm liking this picture because it, it definitely I feel like it gives me a better idea of how they do those. But mm -hmm. there still does seem to be a lot of like, it's, and I guess well, if it's this, this big here asshole. and you've got this notch here, it's probably this big here. Yeah, I mean, yeah, which yeah. there is, there's so much that you're, there's so much, it's very calculated assumption, and I understand mm -hmm. that, but it is still assumption, which is very interesting. Like, these guys could have, have had, like, a huge flat, flat head <laughs> that's kind of, that's not in proportion with the area around their eyes and could have squished it's but you know they were like well it's probably around the shape of a of a all these other skulls that we've seen which makes sense yeah. but there's always an there's always weird outliers you know it's yeah and you know we have always. such diversity within humans too that it's uh, whenever you find one skull like okay they found the biggest hominid skull ever uh, in China yeah, maybe that was the biggest human <laughs> ever but but uh, <laughs> but. But ratios over all of the skulls that you, we have found over over you know mm -hmm. all of the when it starts to it starts to fit pretty nicely again into these boxes and categories and we label it and we narrow it down and say aha that's it. But then you're right. We probably are still missing yeah. a lot. It's all statistics. <sighs> the yeah. Margin of error. Yeah, things that are statistics, but in practice a lot more is uh, vaccine development. And one important vaccine that we are having, we've had so much trouble getting a vaccine, even considering how many people are affected by the parasite every year, is a vaccine from malaria. And there have been clinical trials for some vaccines, but there really is not anything other than the anti-parasite parasitical uh, medications that are used currently to be able to get rid of the paras parasite infection. Uh, but resistance is coming up, and so a vaccine would be really great to be able to fight off malaria. Well, there is a new, very small, like 56 people in this very small clinical trial that has taken place uh, and it's for a vaccine scenarios pfspz vaccine now this vaccine is very old school in the way it goes about being a vaccine it's not all fancy mrna like the new versions this is going back to inoculating with virus this vaccine there are three types they're generated creating live parasite from mosquito salivary glands, what? which is very unique. And 
they uh, for PFS PZ, which is the one they're looking at, the virus is irradiated. So they use radiation to kill the virus. So it's live but dead. <laughs> freshly <laughs> dead. Freshly dead. Only yeah. freshly dead. Yes. Uh, and then there are a couple of other ones. PFSPZGA1 has a genetically weakened parasite that gets injected. And then PFSPZCVAC is injected into somebody who is on malaria drugs, anti-malarials. Very interesting strategies for how they're going about doing this. However, that said, this limited trial of 56 uh, volunteers, the participants were either taking pirate pyrith. Py py pyrimethamine, let me get the word right, pyrimethamine, which kills liver stage parasites, or chloroquine, which kills blood stage parasites. And they found that higher doses of the vaccine resulted in efficacy in stopping or blocking infection of up to 87.5%. Ah, which is the really highest good. yeah it's really good this is the highest ever achieved for any malaria vaccine um it's again a really small trial this trial was a basically in a, a very limited situation this isn't real world application so if you're going to apply it in brazil or africa you're going to come across people who are eating different diets who have different e ecological environmental factors there might be other parasites in their blood that could limit the effectiveness of the vaccine we don't know any of those things yet uh, but it's appeared very in a limited sense effective which is this is you know a little bit of hope for malaria the researchers who are involved though they keep saying and maybe it'll get there someday malaria infects hundreds of thousands of people around the world every year it just doesn't affect anybody in america mm -hmm. so there's no operation warp speed for a malaria vaccine but if there were they think they could probably get a vaccine within five years and otherwise we're just going to keep throwing mosquito nets at people yeah. And uh, mosquito nets and anti-malarials anti can be effective. Mm -hmm. The World Health Organization just announced that China is malaria-free. They went the last three years with zero indigenous infections. And that has been through a very, very stringent program of monitoring, of using anti-malarial medications, of uh, genotyping strains that they find in infected people in the country. Um, so it was a long, hard road, but uh, China yeah. reached zero malaria. Hmm. Uh, it's yeah. one of those things that you're right. We don't think about uh, or talk about much in the United States. Uh, I had the pleasure of uh, uh, being friends with a physicist here at UC Davis who was from India. And uh, explained it. Well, it was talking about some some story about uh, malaria that was in the news, whatever. And he was like, "Oh yeah, I've had it like four times." <laughs> <laughs> like it's like it's not just yeah, it's not just a random occasional thing that has an outbreak somewhere. It's kind of like an omnipresent uh, mm -hmm. disease. And as climate change happens, it will reach places like the United States. It will mm -hmm. reach the rich countries that have been, you know, have escaped the effects so far. Um, you know, so we are short-sighted to ignore problems like these. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. This is This Week in Science. Thank you for listening to the show. We hope that we give you a little hope for the world with all the science that we bring week in and week out. If you like the show, please recommend it to a friend. Let's come on back for a little COVID update. Is it a good one? Should I go? <laughs> I think it's a fairly good one. Oh, good. Uh, <laughs> so our CDC director, Walensky, is doubling down on her view that people in the United States who are vaccinated should be able to go mask free, even with the rising cases of Delta variant, which is now up to 20 percent of all reported cases in the country. 
Places like Israel have shown that their vaccinated population is holding the line, or at least seems to be. And this is part of the evidence that I'm sure uh, the CDC is using in making their guidelines. As the CDC is creating guidelines for the United States specifically, and not like the whole the, the, the World Health Organization, which has to look at all the countries around the world where there are a significant population of individuals not vaccinated at this point in time. Vaccinated individuals do seem to be overall protected. The risk to infection, even with the Delta variant, is drastically reduced compared to unvaccinated individuals. And so far, the cases that Israel are reporting, they are not reporting deaths. They're not getting into hospitalizations and deaths in the way that their earlier uh, that their earlier ramp, their earlier wave seemed to do. So at this point in time, they are still very. There's still a low number of cases, very, very low, similar to last year around this time. And the United States also cases have dropped around around the country but there are pockets where cases are starting to increase los angeles is starting to recommend masks be worn again indoors um oregon we're looking good uh our cases are down and today was the first day that we're supposedly open for business you can make your own choices um, wherever you are, that's what the CDC so, well, in the United yeah. States is do, is saying, is that states can make their own regulations, localities can make yes. their own regulations. And but so of can course, businesses. So, can people so this businesses. is the other yep. thing to remember, is regardless of what the minimum threshold the federal or the state government has put out there, uh, I don't think there's a, for instance, a, a Davis town, right? I don't think there's a business in town you can walk into without a mask on right now. Mm -mm. Uh, it's they still have it's it very out variable. Front. Yeah, I went shopping uh, last weekend and went to three stores in a row, and two of them required me to wear a mask, and the third said, you can take your mask off if you're vaccinated. So that kind of variability is part of the problem and the confusion and what could also contribute to problems moving forward. So... Uh, it is well documented at this point that masks do contribute to a reduction in transmission, even with vaccinated individuals. So even if you are vaccinated and you do get infected, if you wear a mask, you will be less likely to spread it to other people, even though you already have a reduced probability of spreading it to other people because you have less viral load. There are a lot of factors at play, but the one thing that we're learning is that masking is effective and there is a study out of duke university that found that uh that masking can prevent covid 19 transmission in schools they did a statewide analysis of uh the last year and what happened in schools with masking and no masking in north in the north carolina school districts for k-12 education and charter schools and their take home message is that they don't necessarily have to close schools again and they don't even necessarily have to provide six feet of distance for students as long as masks are involved. Mm -hmm. If masks are involved, the kids will be safe um, and that they did not have transmission of virus when masks were included in schools. I mean, and, and to all the people who, you know, 18 months ago said, oh, kids will never wear masks. Kids it's, have learned great. They're doing kids, a great job. They're so adaptable. <laughs> and they're, some of them they're are doing better, better at it than their parents. They'll be like, mom, yeah. put your mask on. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, I, I think this is really great news for the kids. I think the thing that still kind of messes me up is that if I'm vaccinated, and I get COVID and I don't know I have COVID because I don't have symptoms because I'm vaccinated. Mm -hmm. But then somebody else nearby is not vaccinated, but is not wearing a mask for whatever reason. <laughs> they can get COVID and get really, 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 really sick. Yeah. And for the two weeks before they get sick, they can then spread it to a bunch of other people. Yeah. And so I think 
this is the part that still is so such a bummer because we're all working off the honor system and uh, you know at least in this country and uh we we have proven to not be stellar at the honor system in the past and i think this is still kind of an issue but you know the other thing that I, I keep trying to remind myself is at least a lot of countries most countries if you're leaving the us they want a negative covid test regardless of your vaccination status before you can enter their country. And at least as long as that holds, we can prevent more worldwide spread, like was happening at the end of 2019 and beginning of 2020 when nobody knew and it was just hopping all over the globe. So, you know, what I really hope for COVID, for the future of COVID, at least from a worldwide scale, is that we don't drop those. I think that is really essential to preventing this from going Absolutely testing. Crazy. Yeah. Monitoring testing is a huge aspect to being able to keep it under control, especially with regard to things like the Olympics. And they've <laughs> already already had issues with uh, with athletes from different countries being tested at, when they arrive in Japan and finding that they are covid positive and then having to quarantine. And so this is um, this is this is a, it's still a big deal. It's mm -hmm. not, it's, it's not as big a deal as it was in January when we were having a huge wave all over the place. Australia is going through it right now. It's their winter. They're in the they're in the middle of it and probably going to hit a pretty huge wave because they have a very large unvaccinated population, um, unless they maintain their strict quarantines, which a lot of areas are doing, and they're also uh, installing travel mandates between different parts of Australia and New Zealand. So there are a lot of ways to manage the spread. Um, but the yeah, ventilation, masking, these are, and vaccination, vaccination mm -hmm. is protective. You add the things together and they all reduce your risk. Um, but I do hope that people in the Northern Hemisphere do enjoy a bit of their summer because check your the numbers in your local area. If you are vaccinated, you may get it, but you may not get it as badly. May not. The risk is lower. Um, outdoors. Outdoors is a lot safer than indoors. And summer is a wonderful time for outdoors. Keep testing. Keep doing these things. That's it for my COVID update. Does anyone have anything else? No. No. Oh, well then. <laughs> Thank you for being a part of this episode of This Week in Science. We appreciate the time you have taken to spend with us. If you do enjoy the show every single week, take a moment to click, go over to twist.org and click on our Patreon link. You can choose to support us at just about any level of your choosing, $10 and more per month. We will thank you by name at the end of the show. We really can't do this without you. Thank you for your support. So now we come back to just, wait, no, not uh, Justin's, wait, Justin's what? no, that was just one corner. week. No, it? Oops, no, wait. mine. I don't want to give it back. You don't want to give it uh, back? Hey, who's uh, taking it was the never controls? yours to take. <laughs> <laughs> you know what it is, everybody. It's time for Blair's Animal Corner. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. What you got, Blair? Oh, I have some truly wild science I'm pretty excited to tell you all about paras parasites that convince their host to go jump in a lake. <laughs> Um, this is a study. Oh, is that from, the cricket go one? Jump in a lake. No, there yes, is. So, there's the cricket yes, one that makes them yes. jump into the pool. Yes. So this is a study from Kobe University looking at a parasite that usually infects crickets and mantises, mantids. Um, to yeah, so they they're called hair worms, which sounds so gross. <laughs> so gross. And, <laughs> and they is it your they, hair or are they worms? It's it's a little bit of column A. 
a little bit of column B. Um, anyway, they infect these these insects and convince them to take a long swim and never come back. Um, and so the way that they do that has always been kind of a weird phenomena. Like it for over a hundred years, this 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 was discovered about a hundred years ago, but um, they don't know how they make the insects do this. And where this gets weird is the fact that, so normally I would say, okay, killing your host is being a really bad parasite, but in the, in the hairworm life cycle, they got to get to the water. Yes. They reproduce in water. So they, they are nematomorph parasites. They live inside insects, but they reproduce in rivers and ponds. So to get there, they manipulate their host to jump into the water and essentially kill themselves. They whisper in their brains, yeah. go jump yes. in a lake. So this is what they sought out to do. How the heck are these hair worms convincing these animals that they're inside to kill themselves in water? <laughs> this is crazy. Um, and so what what is the kind of what is the mechanism that's driving them towards water to take this uh, forever dip? And so they had a theory and I, I'll try to bring this from beginning to end so you can kind of follow me. So originally it was thought that it might have something to do with the reflected light on the surface of the water. But there are other forms of brightness in the wild. There's forest openings, there's sand, there's grasslands, there's things that reflect sunlight and moonlight. There's lots of reflective surfaces. So don't really think that's what it is. And if they were attracted to every single occurrence, this manipulation wouldn't work because it would only work, I don't know, one out of 10 times or something like that. So it wouldn't effectively and consistently bring these hair worms home. <laughs> so they thought that perhaps it had something to do with the polarization of the light. Polarized light is a type of light where the electric field of that light oscillates in only one direction. And the light reflected off water contains a lot of horizontally polarized light. And it has been shown in the past that anthropods use horizontally polarized light to seek or avoid water. So with this information, they know that water creates this horizontally um, polarized light. They also know that arthropods are capable of seeing and detecting that polarization. So those two things together, and especially the fact that they can, these insects can use that information specifically related to water, means this is, now we have a working theory. They have a hypothesis. Does the parasite use the animal's ability to see polarized light to make them go toward polarized light. So here's step one. They made a cylinder. They divided it into three sections. Polarized light on one end, unpolarized light on the other. The mantid was placed in the middle and then they saw what happened 10 minutes later. And they moved towards the polarized light. Over the course of these tests, they used different strengths of light to see what strength of light was best. And they wanted to see if that was, if brightness had anything to do with it. So aside from the polarization, what about brightness? So they chose polarized light compared to uninfected individuals. When you have the infected ones, they went for the polarized light. And they found a particular uh, type of light, about 2000 lux that was chosen as the best brightness for them. Um, but then they double checked it. They did not choose polarized light if the angle was vertical instead of horizontal. So it's definitely this horizontally polarized light. And the infected individuals are going after this, not the healthy ones. And this was regardless of strength of the light, they could change that all up and down, but it, what, it they went for horizontal over, over vertical every time. And so, okay, yes, they are attracted to horizontally polarized light. Then they took it outdoors. And that's what we're seeing right now on the screen is the outdoor experiment. They wanted to see whether infected mantids would jump into a pool reflecting strong horizontally polarized light. 
They set up a mesh enclosure. There were two pools. Pool A had the horizontally polarized but dim light. And pool B, the reflection was brighter but weakly polarized. Mm. So they released them. Poor buddies. (laughs) In between the two and observed, quote unquote, their entry into the water. Sorry, buddies. (laughs) And among the 16 infected mantids that exhibited the behavior, 14 entered pool A, strongly reflected, horizontally polarized light. The other kind of funny thing is that they found that a lot of them did it at midday. So they were also in the initial experiment, they walked more in midday. So there is also some sort of circadian rhythm potentially related to this. Um, that has to do with the attraction to this horizontally polarized light or their activity in general, who knows. But so there's there's something about the specificity of the time of day as well. So this is the first time in the world, according to the the people who wrote this paper. So, you know, maybe there's a, a little paper out there somewhere else. We never know, right, when people make these comments. But this is the first time in the world <laughs> that parasites have been shown to manipulate the ability to respond to light. (laughs) So this is a very specific behavior that they are impacting through their, their (laughs) parasitization. So the next step, the next step of this is to actually figure out what the mechanism is. What are they manipulating in the body of these animals to have them react a certain way to a light source, which we don't know yet. Yeah, what I think is so interesting about this is that this does hint at a mechanism. Instead of Mm -hmm. just saying, oh, the fungus makes the ant climb to the top of the tree and bite onto the tree until something (laughs) eats it. You know, it's... Zombie fungus. Right, it's, it's... This is actually this... The whole life cycle is kind of telling you, okay, this is what it's making it doing. And all these experiments are allowing them to figure out that it is polarized light. So now this actually gives us a direction that researchers can go, okay, polarized light. How do the mantids perceive the polarized light? What are the mechanisms in the eye Mm -hmm. for polarized differentiation at the molecular level between polarized and unpolarized light? How does the signal get interpreted by the mantid brain? And is it at the level of the brain or at the level of the eye that the parasite is having its effect? Yeah, so so is this impacting perception? Right. Or is it impacting response? Yes. Can they see the polarized light before, but they ignore it because water bad? Right. Or, that's kind of that's kind of how I'm I'm uh that's how, sort of like how I'm like uh seeing this too is yeah, that's just how uh, they bring mantises see light and identify water. And so if that's the thing that they're being told to go to, that's already what they use to identify it. Then that's they're going to. It's not necessarily that their eyes are getting tricked. Uh, it's still got to be a motivational response on some level. And basically changing a motivational response. So like in the case of Toxoplasma gondii, where it makes an animal that normally does not go out into the daylight or is, you know, isolated, seek out daylight and other organisms, cats, that would normally makes, eat yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> makes mice uh, attracted to the sense Sudden, of cat urine and but makes, it's this uh, baby friendliness. hyenas not afraid yeah. of lions. And yeah, yeah, but also uh, like rabies, who makes you randomly hydrophobic. Yeah. <laughs> right. There, there's, yeah, so there's lots of mechanism-based questions here that could potentially yeah. be cracked at. So... Very, I thought, just a wild, a, a wild idea to be able to look closer at this. I love it. I love it when science can look at a question in animals and go, okay, let's start figuring it out. And yeah, they were able to come. I mean, the creativity to come up with experiments to solve this problem and to start asking these questions in the right way to be able to figure. I mean, this kind of stuff is so cool. How best to drown a bunch of praying mantises without right? any confounding <laughs> variables? What are they looking at? What are they looking at more? Are they, look, are they looking at me or do they look at the pond? Let's see. Indeed. 
Indeed. <laughs> um, so speaking of water, let's instead move to fire. Fire bad. Fire fire is indeed bad. Um, so this is this is very I feel like a um, prescient conversation based on the conversation we were having earlier and what's going on prescient. on the west. Pressure. Um, and anyway, um, this is a study from the from Washington State University, and this is looking at songbirds' response to wildfire. Is it their response in how they move around their environment? Is it their response in what they eat? No, this is the response in their plumage and hormones. Yes. So, uh, just through kind of happenstance, just normal bird surveying stuff that you do if you study birds, uh, it was discovered that habitat destroying wildfires in Australia were followed by male red backed fairy wrens not molting into their ornamental plumage. So, they start, they, most of the year, they're, they're this very kind of drab, good camouflage of, of brown. But normally, when it when it's time to find a a lover, um, they, or you know the other half of the genome of your babies, um, they they molt the males molt into a red and black ornamental plumage. So it's it's very striking. But that wasn't happening after some wildfires. Then they they checked some hormone levels in these individuals and had found lower testosterone. So here's a question is um, the testosterone is responsible for the feathers. So a testosterone spike is what gives them their ornamental plumage. So are the wildfires suppressing testosterone or are the wildfires impacting behavior that secondarily impact testosterone? This is the question, right? Um, so they measured birds fat stores. They measured their stress hormones. They measured a bunch of other things to see if anything else had to do with it. Because if you're super stressed after a wildfire, then that might suppress some of the more energetic, um, kind of expensive, energetically expensive things that you might be doing. Like, you know, losing all your feathers and regrowing new ones. <laughs> yeah. So this, this is an important thing to count out, but it turned out that they were not stressed. They did not show stress hormones that did not appear to have anything to do with it. It was only interfering with their testosterone and therefore their colorful plumage. So that's wild. Yeah. So no stress hormones, just a change in testosterone levels. But you would expect that their testosterone levels would be changing because of the stress of the wildfire. Right. Right. Um, so while they were looking at wildfire impacts on long-term survival of birds, the, they, they kind of happened upon this and decided to really jump into it head on and try to figure out exactly what, what, what the mechanism here was. So the, the hypothesis was that testosterone is an evolved response to a wildfire. It was beneficial for these songbirds to suppress testosterone after a big catastrophic event like this. And the, that hypothesis comes because wildfires destroy their habitat, obviously. So it's not just that like, oh no, where am I going to live? It's no, 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 no. There's no place to live. This is not the time to have a baby. <laughs> So then the, the male birds inhibit or delay their breeding signals. They end up looking just like females when, when breeding season comes so that they are then unattractive to females because they don't want to be tied down right now. So it's, it, it's a response because the likelihood of expending energy into mating and then also taking care of a baby would probably end in bad things. It's a bad use of energy. So they might be better to yeah. wait till the next, the next opportunity, the next year, essentially. Right, because um, if there's a fire, perhaps it has reduced resource resources, maybe it just mm -hmm. all sorts of things are not gonna go well for a clutch of eggs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and so they, they did a really thorough check. They looked at blood samples. 
and they did this for five years at two different sites so they could compare birds living at times and places, experiencing wildfire and not across these different locations, across different years. They looked at temperatures. They looked, like I said, at stress hormones. They looked at all these other things. Um, and so it really just felt like the wildfire and not the dry season. It's not just it being dry and there not being a lot going on, like, oh, we are having a drought. No, it was specifically the wildfire that suppressed the testosterone, therefore suppressed feather color. And so um, really the expectation here is that it's it's male driven to reduce the amount of chicks that are born after a wildfire. It's the selfish male hypothesis. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's you know, I just really need another year to find myself that fire really was tough. So. Yeah, you know, it just you know, I don't yeah, really be tied know down. If this is what I want to do this year. So Yeah. 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 I really need to focus maybe, on me. Maybe next year. year. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> can, you, yeah. can you stay in character like that for the rest of the show <laughs> no it's too hard it would be really awesome uh, anyway I might yeah. have to for one of my later stories oh yeah. okay you can feel yes. the patriarchy just, just <laughs> swelling up inside of me anyway this story could be used for uh, future implications on other species that have coloration signals to mating and places that historically didn't have wildfires that now may yep. and another way that wildfire seasons mess up nature anyway all of that climate change bah! okay that's it it's all connected man yeah it's all connected totally thank you for being a part of twist hey did you want a twist t-shirt or mug we have some cool sciencey goodness t-shirts and mugs in the store right now so if you head over to twist.org and click the zazzle link you can check off check out not check off well you can check off purchasing them from your to-do list but you can also check out the items that we have available and support twist in the meantime Time for some stories from Justin. What you got going on? Global warming. Oh, great. Yeah, it's, about that. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty bad. Like, people are talking about how bad it is. We've been talking about how bad it is since before anybody else. No, before. never. Except for a few scientists we're talking about. We've been talking about this, like, weekly for many, many years now. Uh, but global warming might actually be good news for some California residents. New Cal Poly study finds that rattlesnakes mm. are mm. likely to benefit from the higher temperatures. Combination of factors makes warming climate beneficial to rattlesnakes. Rattlesnakes, by the way, are found in almost every part of the continental United States. But they're especially common in the southwest uh, rattlesnakes are experts at thermoregulation because, of course, they're cold-blooded. They don't really have a choice. They have to pay attention to these things. They found that when given a chance, so they, I guess they had these snakes and they could sort of decide which uh, along a, a, a myriad of different temperature scenarios. Where did they feel the most com comfortable? Where did they most coalesce? And Turns out snakes, uh, the rattlesnakes, preferred a body temperature of 86 to 89 degrees Fahrenheit. That's so lower than I would have expected. Well, but it's also much warmer than the averages that they will experience in nature. So average body temperature of a coastal rattlesnake uh, was about 70 degrees. For if they went inland, it was just 74. So, yeah, the higher the temperatures, the happier they are. Cody voice, this is... Uh, Haley Crowell, we were supposed to see, uh, we were surprised to see how much lower the body temperatures of wild snakes were relative to their preferred body temperatures in the lab. There's a lot of ecological pressures in nature that could prevent rattlesnakes from basking. That's when they go and hang out in the sun, catch those rays. Uh, but they're, when they're there, there's an increased risk of exposure to predators. A warmer climate may help these snakes heat up to temperatures that are more optimal for digestion or reproduction. Uh, Crowell is a graduate uh, student researcher and the project lead of this study. Longer periods of warmer temperatures could also give them a longer active season, <laughs> uh, giving them more time to hunt and feed and reproduce. 
as well. So, because they don't regulate their own body temperature like a warm-blooded creature does, they need to rely on surroundings to provide heat, which usually drastically restricts their activity in cold weather. Remove the cold weather, and you have snakes that are not drastically reduced in their activities. They're just going to keep on keeping on. Uh, in addition to the seasonal snakes changes, keep on snaking. Rattlers could spend more active hours during any given day being mm-hmm. active. Mm-hmm. Rattlesnakes, they say here, uh, eat mostly rodents, but can also eat insects. But apparently we're going to try to avoid those black widows. Yeah. <laughs> it's, can I, can I say one thing about this, though? Is that active rattlesnakes are actually, if you're trying to not be bit as a human, it's actually kind of better. Most rattlesnake bites happen when you step on sleeping snakes. Oh, okay. So when they're active, that's when, first of all, if they hear footfalls or feel footballs, footfalls, they're getting far, 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 far away. But secondly, they use the rattle. <laughs> that's the whole point, right? Is you're too big. I don't want to bite you or eat you. Please leave me alone. Mm-hmm. So if they're awake and active, that actually means they're going to be more actively trying to keep away from you, which is helpful. Okay. So, so okay, so there is a silver lining to global warming then. Less, uh, less likely to be bit by a snake because they're more <laughs> active and awake. Yes, the, however, this, you have rattlesnakes uh, now probably moving into places where people are not used to rattlesnakes, and so they don't know rattlesnake etiquette. So for that reason, they might actually be more likely to get bitten. But and what you describe humans what you, moving into areas where yes. yeah, so there's that both going in each direction. Humans yeah. are going to get bitten more often. That's what's going to happen. What you described, <laughs> uh, Blair, perfectly illustrated my one time almost getting bit by a rattlesnake. You almost, almost stepped on, a, on one. a sleeping one. Yeah, it was it was at night, and this is how country I grew up. We had a crushed granite path from the trailer to the outhouse which was enough distance away from the trailer so that, you know, it was far enough away. And along this crushed granite path, at night, I went walking because in the middle of the night, I had to do number two. Oh, no. I was, this is me at like seven or eight years old or maybe younger. Gosh. And then there was this like bunch of sticks or something. There was a bunch of debris and I was about to kick it off of the path because it's night. But a granite's like kind of light colored, so you could see the contrast. I was about to kick it when something in the back of my head clicked, and it was, "That's a coiled up rattlesnake," which Don't was kick there that thing. at night on the granite path because it was using it was that heat yeah. from the. Gra- pa- Oh, but you're right. Yeah, if it was warmer, it probably would have been like, "I don't need a granite path. I could be yeah. anywhere." I wouldn't have. So if you're in rattlesnake territory, let me just give since we're talking about it a couple pointers here. So if you're if you're on hikes, first of all, never wear open toed shoes on a hike. <laughs> wear closed toed shoes. Second of all, stay on the trail. There's a million reasons to do that, but this is a big one. And then the third is if you think you're moving through a space where there could be snakes, you stomp. You take big stomping steps because that will wake them up. That will give a nice vibration and they're going to get the heck out of there. <laughs> Very good tips. Uh, yeah. Fun th- fact too here is uh, this is actually something that you mentioned in your earlier study uh, about snakes not eating a whole lot. Apparently, they are very efficient uh, in their digestive systems or in their uh, their use of, of food. It says here an adult rattlesnake needs only 500 to 600 calories to survive for an entire year. That's about one ground squirrel. Yep. Uh, although. Uh, Additional calories uh, to make up for the energy spent hunting and bearing young and other activities that snakes might do. So they might need to eat a little bit more than that. But uh, it's a, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, humans need three to four times that many calories per day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so different animals have problem, different energetic though. needs for yeah. metabolism. Yeah, yeah. So if snakes can't leave though, to if they're in an area like where they currently are, and it gets too hot for them, then they end up actually being active more and need more food. So that's a whole nother 
issue potentially Ooh. as well. So if they had, if they were awake more often and more active, then they'd mm-hmm. need more calories, and so mm-hmm. then they'd be eating more ground squirrels and mm-hmm. maybe taking Nature's care of that problems. ground squirrel population that more... San Diegans complain about. I don't know. All <laughs> and right, feeding more raptors and feeding more raptors. But one of the so anyway, the silver lining of this story is they're saying that uh, there's a a bubble of an ecosystem that's going to really enjoy global warming, and it's going to be snakes and vultures. Yeah, there you go. There we go. But if you are in the dark, what do you need to be looking at, Justin? Anything? Oh, this is actually this is a buried the lead. This is the biggest story I think of the uh, the week, if not the year so far. Uh-oh. Uh, researchers at Chalmers University of Technology, Sweden, they succeed in developing a method to label mRNA molecules and, then la- and follow the path of mRNA through cells in real time using basically a microscope without affecting the properties or subs- uh, subsequent activity protein uh, formation of those mRNA. Uh, this is a breakthrough that is going to have game-changing effects on all sorts of research. So most of us are now kind of familiar with mRNA. We got the major vaccines uh, that uh, thanks to science and RNA, there are, uh, we have the Pfizer and the Moderna are mRNA-based vaccines. RNA-based therapeutics actually have a whole bunch of things that they, they're working on that are opportunities to prevent, treat, potentially cure many, many diseases. Currently, though, delivery of RNA therapeutics into cells is pretty inefficient, mostly because we don't really know what we're doing in the research. What we get are snapshots of given time points where we can go and look at something and see, okay, did the mRNA get there? How much of it's there compared to what else is there? Uh, But this is an active, ongoing system, so when you have your time points for research and you have to kill the cell to find out what's going on in it, you end what was happening in that cell and you have to kind of string it together with a bunch of other dead cells that you killed at different times to try to build the picture. It lacks some important details about what's going on, uh, but it can also create inaccurate data that then frustrates scientific process, uh, progress and process, right? So great benefit of this new method. Oh, I'm actually quoting now. Uh, this is Ellen Esbjörner. Uh, associate professor of the Department of Biology and Biotechnology, who is the second lead author of the article. The great benefit of this method is that we can now easily see where in the cell the delivered mRNA goes and in which cells the protein is formed without losing RNA's natural protein translating ability. New method, uh, recently presented in the Journal of American Chemical Society, will make the development of new treatments more efficient as well as add a wealth of knowledge to pathologists, biotech engineers, anyone who's interested in studying physiological processes in cells, whether they be human or plant. Uh, It's huge. That's amazing. We've known for a while that mRNA plays a lot of regulatory uh, roles within cells and within processes, but again, without the ability to sort of observe how they're going, where they are, what they're doing, it's sort of been a mystery. We can attach some importance to the presence or lack of presence, Uh, but the research behind this method was done in collaboration with chemists and biologists at Chalmers, that's the Swedish uh, technical university, and the uh, biopharmaceuticalists at AstraZeneca. Which is interesting because you hear AstraZeneca and you go, aha, they made a vaccine. Yeah, it's the company that made the vaccine. But they're actually, even though their vaccine is not uh, mRNA based, the company is actually one of the leading mRNA therapy researchers in other uh, arenas. So they're part of this uh, for, for a good reason. The method involves replacing one of the building blocks of RNA with a fluorescent variant, which apart from that, everything else remains the same natural properties, does the thing the mRNA did before. Fluorescent units can then be used to produce the messenger RNA without affecting them being translated into proteins. They can then 
allows the researchers to follow functional mRNA molecules in real time, seeing how they are taken up into cells with just the help of a, a microscope. So this is... This is almost as big, I think, uh, I think this might actually be bigger than what we've learned about the microbiome in terms of the human health physiology. This is a missing ingredient. In I don't think it's how- bigger, but it, what it does is it's a tool that will allow that uh, investigation into that to take place. Where is... Where are short sequences of mRNA being distributed? Where are they getting inserted? How are they acting? What's, yeah. you know, what is acting? Um, yeah. But it's, it's thought is, to be, it's believed to be, mRNA is one of those things between mm-hmm. genome as a blueprint, right, and uh, epigenetic uh, yes. outcomes. And this is long thought to be where a lot of that uh, regulatory aspect of expression is actually uh, controlled in a weird way, right? So being able to, to finally visualize it means the whole genomic field also gets to take a big step forward uh, with new research. It's huge. Yeah. We like to see things. Visu- visualization is amazing. That's going to, yeah, that's big. Cool story. I like it. Uh Taking you into a couple. Oop! There's my there's my show notes. That was fun. Woo! Show notes, everybody. I'm gonna take us into uh, from. I'm gonna take us into some microbes and into your gut for a moment, and then into your brain, because I like to do stuff like that. So uh, apparently, according to some new research out of an international research team. This is Singaporeans, researchers in the UK, Australia, Canada, US, and Sweden, led by principal investigator, Professor Sven Peterson, National Neuroscience Institute of Singapore, and visiting professor at Lee Kong Chan School of Medicine in Nanyang Technological University. They've looked at gut microbes that metabolize tryptophan nice amino acid that is supposed to make us sleepy that's supposed to be in the turkey at thanksgiving that's really not the thing that makes you sleepy with the turkey at thanksgiving but we like to say it anyway would you remind me every thanksgiving because i forget <laughs> it from year to year <laughs> it's like the turkey it's not really the turkey it's like a piece a lot of, of food. locked in information <laughs> that refuses to leave my brain <laughs> yes Well, hopefully this study will lock itself into your brain. Really amazing. These microbes, usually the groups of microbes are uh, microbes that can be dangerous to humans, pathogenic microbes like E. coli. These microbes metabolize tryptophan and secrete little molecules that are called indoles. And these indoles apparently... We don't know whether they actually do travel through the bloodstream between the gut and the brain, but indoles, according to this study, um, they mediate the development of new brain cells in the hippocampus. So these indoles trigger the birth of new brain cells in an area of your brain that's responsible for forming new memories and helping your cognition. So you can already see where this is going with its implications for how tryptophan or bacteria or even, imagine this, just indoles could be used to fight the ravages of aging on the brain. If you can continue to stimulate the birth of new brain cells. These uh, indoles, they mediate signals that lead to regulatory factors that lead to the production of these new brain cells, the neurogenesis in the hippocampus. And this is published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. The researchers do wonder, you know, is this the kind of thing that could lead to dietary intervention? Could you also just eat tryptophan rich food if you have these bacteria but knowing that these bacteria are usually pathogenic species of bacteria do we really want to feed them all that much so could we just go for it if it gets you a better brain i (laughs) think shot i need the help 
Let's go I there. I do. Uh, but there are many indole rich foods. Broccoli, cauliflower, the brassicas, these uh, cabbages, they are rich in indoles. And so perhaps eating indole rich foods are what can help keep your brain happy and healthy into long age. We don't know this for sure yet, but it sure is a nice thought. Perhaps, I love it. But I'm going to go buy. So all the much broccoli. broccoli. Yeah. <laughs> Which also, like, isn't broccoli a derivative of mustard? So then just put mustard on your broccoli. You should be good. Yes. All the mustard, it all the broccoli. Sound very good. <laughs> mustard covered yeah, and then cauliflower. Yeah, sprinkle some pathogens on top of it with a slice of turkey, and you have the recipe for the perfect brain. <laughs> yes, exactly. You need the microbes, though, that are in there. But, uh, yeah, it's very exciting new neuroscience research it could potentially shift not just how we eat for old age, but it could understanding these mechanisms of new neuron formation could lead to treatments for stroke and brain injury. Oh, yeah. Which would yes. Be cool. That's awesome. And, yeah. Could. These are all far off possibilities at this point in time. Um, speaking of, I don't know, this isn't like a near possibility, but do you have you ever boiled a lobster? No. I've been present but I've never done it myself. Right, so, yeah, lobsters, we catch them, people put them in the pot, and there's this question as to whether or not they feel pain. Now, as researchers, neuroscientists, and perceptual researchers will tell you, there's no way to know if they actually feel right. pain as we define it. But, but they, they have do, nerves. <laughs> they, have do, they have nerves, and, of course, they have probably mechanisms and temperature sensors that allow them to stay out of too hot waters so they don't get boiled naturally. Anyway, this work out of UCSD in pharmacology, biochemistry, and behavior, behavior investigated the question of what happens if you um, give lobsters pot THC pot, not just put them in a pot, oh, but if you give them pot, THC give them yes, I see. before you put them in the pot, does that change the way that they act as they are boiling? I would imagine. I would not. I would imagine no. I think if you took a completely sober human, if they were trying to bridge this sort of amorphization uh, thing going on, and a Somebody who is very stoned, and you threw both of them in boiling water, I bet they both scream. Yes. And it, it appears as though that's what happens with <laughs> lobsters as well. Except no, none of the screaming. Just the THC does appear to enter the lobster through the gills. They did tissue analysis to see whether the THC had actually made its way into the lobster. And yes, indeed... Lobsters can inhale, and the lobsters then, their behavior does change. So their claw waving and their various behaviors do change as a result of the change in THC levels in their tissues. However, when boiled in a pot of water, the THC did not seem to change their behavior <laughs> in any way. Right, 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 right. right. Thank you, uh, Eknap49 in the chat room. So how do you want your lobster? Uh, baked or boiled? Uh, both. <laughs> what? Uh, both. Yeah, both. Baked yes. and boiled. Oh boy. Yes. So what a, what, uh, a, what a wild what a wild <laughs> study. My my thing is I I understand you want to you want to feel like you're not causing pain. I do understand that. Yes. But also like, is there a larger um, kind of extrapolated meaning of the study? Because I I kind of scrolled past this uh in my research as well and I, I couldn't help but wonder like i'm i'm hoping there's something else that this can be applied to as well <laughs> um at this point the uh the conclusions that they they make uh do not indicate that there's more that can be learned other than an understanding a greater understanding of how uh, lobsters and potentially other shellfish, crustaceans, uh, do have uh, how they 
detect temperature, so hot water nociception, as it is termed. It just feels like people want to feel less guilty about you. And that's lobster. and that's where and that's where it came from. So the uh, the rationale as they so their their study vapor exposed to uh, delta nine tetrahydrocannabinol oh tetra nine tetrahydrocannabinol God, I, can't, I can't talk chem, chemistry today tetrahydrocannabin cannabinol shows lo, slows locomotion of the main lobster homaris americanus rationale despite long history of use in synaptic physiology the lobster has been a neglected model for behavioral pharmacology a restaurateur proposed that exposing lobster to cannabis smoke reduces anxiety and pain during the cooking process. It is unknown if gill respiration in air would result in significant THC uptake and whether this would have any detectable behavioral effects. Long I love this. Short. This sounds like uh, this sounds like the restaurateur was walked in on. He's like, "What are you doing in here? You're supposed to be cooking the lobster." He's just like, "I'm uh, uh I, this is part of the process. I swear." I'm maybe trying to I'm trying to help the lobsters here. <laughs> well, this is no, but but this is this is not too far of a cry <laughs> from a range, uh, you know, cage-free <laughs> range animals. Uh, you know, I guess mm-hmm. this was uh, your your meal was uh, raised on an organic farm where it had plenty of uh, room to run around. It was fed nothing but organic food and the very best <laughs> marijuana that we could possibly supply it. Like, you know. And at least it was entirely confused before yeah, it went into the pot. <laughs> like, just so you know, just so you know, if you didn't eat this, it wasn't oh. going to do anything uh, with its life. It was a procrastinator. Yeah. So according to, according to science, uh, if you are cooking lobster, it's not necessarily going to benefit the lobster once it's going once it's in the water. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There Just you go. Thought you should know. There you go. And there we go. Have we come to the end of another episode? Oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Blair says, "Oh yeah, we're oh, done yeah. already. We did it." We're all done. All right. Well, if you have any questions for us out there, you can send emails to Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com or uh, you can leave us a message on our Facebook page, This Week in Science. Thank you. I hope you're all staying cool wherever you are. I hope you are vaccinated if you can be. I hope you are staying safe. And thank you for listening to the show. Thank you to... Fada for your help with social media and show notes. Thank you to Gord for helping with the chat rooms. Identity4, thank you for recording the show. And Rachel, thank you for your amazing assistance. And for all of our wonderful Patreon sponsors out there, I would love to say thank you for all of your support on Patreon. Thank you, too. Pierre Velazar, Ralphie Figueroa, John Ratnaswamy, Kira, Carl Kornfeld, Melanie Stegman, De Cranstuck, Karen Tazi, Woody MS, Andre Bassett, Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vigor, Chefstad, Hal Snyder, Donathan Styles, aka Don Stylo, John Lee, Ali Coffin, Matty Pear, and Gaurav Sharma, Shu Brew, Don Mundus, Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fredis 104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, Jack, Brian Carrington, Matt Bass, Joshua Fury, Sean and Nina Lamb, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessenflow, Jean Tellier, Steve Leesman, a.k.a. Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Dana Pearson, Richard, Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Kevin Rails, back flying out, Christopher Dreyer, Mark Massaros, Artyom, Greg, Blake, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, this profile name is hilarious in the context of some other podcast, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Matt Sutter, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Mountain Sloth, Jim Drapo, Sarah Chavez, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, E.O., Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul Stanton, Paul Disney, Patrick Pecoraro, Tony Steele, Ulysses Adkins, Brian Condren, and Jason Roberts. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. And if you are interested in supporting us on Patreon, Head over to Twists and click on the Patreon link. On next week's show! We will be... Are we coming back next week, too? Are we going to do it again? Okay, then I guess we'll be back uh, Wednesday again at 8 p.m. 
Pacific Time, uh, broadcasting live from our YouTube and Facebook channels, as well as twist.org slash live. Hey, do you want to listen to us as a podcast? Maybe make a souffle while you listen? Just search for This Week in Science wherever podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, you can get your friends to subscribe as well. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes and links to stories are available on our website, www.twist.org. And you can also sign up for a newsletter. You can also contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at ThisWeekInScience.com, Justin at TwistBinion at gmail.com, or Blair, me, at BlairBaz at Twist.org. Just be sure to put Twist, T-W-I-S, in the subject line, or your email will be spam filtered into a snake inside of a spider in Australia. Ah! It was sucked by a, next to a neutron star into a black hole. Yeah. That was uh, smoking the good stuff with a lobster. Yeah. Moments before being boiled to death. Uh-huh. Where you can also ping us on the Twitter, where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. Hey, and if you learned anything from the show, remember... It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science is the end of the world. So I'm setting up a shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robot with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan If you listen to the science you may just yet understand That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy Jeopardy, jeopardy And this week in science is coming your way So everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our method instead of rolling a die we may rid the world of toxoplasma, got the eye. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 Got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week This week in science is coming your way you better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said Then please just remember it's all in your head Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science this week in science, 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 this week in science.
I cut that off just a hair too early, but it's the after show now. It's the after show. I can fix it. <laughs> it's the after show. It's the after show, 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 for show, show, for show, 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 for show, show, for show, show. Who's full of science and goodness? You're full of science and goodness. Who's full of science and goodness? Yeah, full of science and goodness. Ooh, twenty percent off of Savazos. Science and goodness mug. You want it? And you like these pillows? Mm-hmm. How's it going, Blair? Pretty good. Oh, here comes Justin. He's coming back. This week in science. This week in science. This week in. So you had the you had the Zazzle store up there, I think, for a second. I did. Can I can I? Uh, I'm going to uh, speak about the quality of things purchased on Zazzle. Yes, uh, this is a, a good you conversation. Like so, so I'm talking about this, the older version, the pre Blair version. Uh huh. That's still this, there. This this one here. I, like I have, I know I'm selling now, which this feels weird on the show, but I've got people know your mouse pad is not supposed yeah. to last a decade and a half. Yeah, it just is not. This thing's still in great condition, and I'm actually like very impressed with the uh, the quality of the. It's right pis- there. There's the mouse pad. There right we there. go. Right there, mouse pad. There's quite Best. a few mouse pads in that store. Yes. Yeah, like a cephalopod. The, I've I've literally had this thing for I think for a decade and a half now. That's a <laughs> That's long time to for have a, a mouse pad. pad. That is yeah. really outliving what its expected life was. So oh, look, there's a science with a twist poster. <laughs> mm-hmm. Let's see. Gorov was them. asking if there are indoor doormats. Oh, Did anyone door buy mats. the leggings? That's such a great idea. I haven't ordered the leggings because would... I'm just bad at shopping oh. and I keep meaning to. Gorov, so I'm, I'm to. now totally. I hope they have one in there because I would love a twist doormat. That would be amazing. Right? That'd yeah. be fun. Oh, here. I, I didn't mean to show this off, but look. Oh, okay. oh yeah. Oh, that's a pretty nice. phone cover. Yeah. yeah. Like yeah. that phone cover. This is the this is the second of the show we like to call the in-house commercial. Oh, I'm also <laughs> wow. I'm I'm doing a lot of it. I'm wearing the the sweatshirt right now too. Awesome. Sweat twist. Oh, look, there are doormats. There are. Okay. Yes. Wait, Let me see. I I am I'm predicting an entire new line of Blair swag coming soon. <laughs> <laughs> there yeah, well. are. Doormats. So Blair, I'm gonna let you do that. I mean, I can okay. show, but then I mean. Okay. They, yeah. Let me. Here. I'm not good at the. the you, you can watch me make it like we've done in the past. If you <laughs> That's want. what I was gonna say. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome sure, to sure. Twist QVC. You better hurry. Lim- quantities are limited. Blair, What's I'm not that? saying you are a doormat, oh, uh, but I'm uh, sure you can make a great one. Demand, so they're not limited. <laughs> uh, well, okay. Okay. What's it in? Um. I don't think I'm it. Yeah, you'd make a great doormat, Blair. That's right. <laughs> oh, I'll show you what God. kind of doormat I I am if it's okay that with you. That you make. <laughs> I'll show you what kind of doormat I make. Like really uh, show you. Doormat. So what's the difference between these? Probably size. So so Ooh, while I you're like looking while one. you're looking into this, while you're looking okay. into this, Nolan Richardson posted something uh, which may have been troll bait or may have been an honest question. I don't know, but I didn't see them post anything else, so I'm just guessing. And so you're like, let's talk about it. Yeah, so let's talk about it. <laughs> Is scientific truth a universal truth? And it was uh, one way back there. It's way it was like the middle of the show. And Gord, I think, had yeah. a nice answer about it. Science is about the the questions more than it is about the answers. Yes. But I will say, like, there is something universal truth about uh, some science that is applies, meaning that it applies beyond our planet. It applies throughout the entire universe, and the and the the. The fundamentals of what we understand about chemistry, as an example, are going to be chemistry 
throughout the universe. It's going to be, it's like one of the fun things that allows scientists to sort of understand what might be happening on far distant stars and planets is that the chemistry of the universe is the chemistry of the universe, not the chemistry of Earth. Not the chemistry. Oh, what elements we have, what things are interacting because of temperature ranges and pressure ranges. Yeah, that, that's going to change the, you know, when things are in what state where and all of that. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. But the building blocks that we, uh, that we have to encounter as Earthlings are the same building blocks we would encounter anywhere in the universe. And that is a universal truth. That really, if you think about it, for this one little pale blue rock floating around, one dusky red rosy star in billions within the solar system, er, the galaxy, and then stars. billions of galaxies, and then the phenomenal astronomical things of scale that we can say words and put numbers, but they're still incomprehensible scales upon which the universe exists Who, those can building add blocks dream now blair you definitely those can blocks, absolutely the same doormats it's doormat making time yeah i mean i think when you come down to the question of universal truths it's questions of physics and mathematics um you know like you were talking about it kind of depends and anthony is saying depends on the science yeah and it's like there are some universal truths and even for biology and there are physicists who have delved into the questions of what are the basic physics of life you know what allows what are the, what are what are the physics at play that allow for the chemical inter interactions that allow for life to happen um you know and so there are some interesting chemical points that are universal for life on earth but that could be different for life in another place if it's based on dif different chemistry but the chemistry itself will be the same i mean that the right. the that what those building blocks will be the same how they're arranged how they get utilized these are sort of but and it's sort of it and and then there's a weird way that we 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 go down right to the hard science where we talk about the universal but then on some yeah. level, you know, Look at the that. science of communication is likely very universal. You know, that, that, that science that life or the uh, communication that life has all of these, uh, whether it's a chemical communication, whether wh like whatever level communication or information transfer is taking place at, there's sort of uh, etiquette or process or regulation that can kind of define what communication must look like between other life forms as well so i don't know about that necessarily i mean it all depends on how you perceive and if your communication is based on vibrations or on light shows or right, right. Well, I, there's but, but, so many different have, ways i mean communication yeah. you, the universal truth for communication is that there's always going to be a sender and a receiver yeah right that's the mm -hmm. universal truth but how it's sent and received well yeah but but my my point in that is that we can see how many different forms of communication on this one planet right and we can't talk to dolphins yet although oh yeah actually we can <laughs> We can. We're just bad <laughs> listeners. It turns out we can actually we can actually talk to them and they can understand what we're asking. We just suck at listening back. Oh my god. So there was this really funny article last week that somebody posted to me and like for a hot second I was like, "What? Is it's one of those those articles. Is this real? There's no way. Is this real?" And of course, it was a, like a satire site. But the um, the story was the <laughs> dolphin seen to stop smiling as he, when humans turn their backs. <laughs> oh, oh gosh! Oh wow, that's yeah, hilarious. Can't, 
<laughs> when the cameras are turned off and the dolphins think no one is looking at them, they stop smiling. <laughs> it's it's like the 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 uh, Far Side cartoon where the uh, the cows the cows uh, stop being bipedal only when there's humans around. <laughs> No, they become bipedal when you... Yeah, right. Humans are here. Time to act like cows again. Yep. Okay. All right. Oh, humans are gone. Everybody back to bipedal. Carry on. Martini's yeah. in hand. Her hoof. Yeah. Well, there's... Yeah, there's so many interesting aspects to all... Like, yeah, life, the universe. I mean, there's the one question, because we are so limited in where we are in the universe, there's uh, been a question as researchers are looking at uh, expansion in the universe and we have like our local constants and we are pretty sure that the constants are pretty constant everywhere, but they might not be. <laughs> that there might be places where things slow down, speed up, change in our own universe, but we don't know that because we're not there. But everything that we can see and measure from where we are so far appears to be homogeneous that we it, yeah. that it all works together it's just always that weird thing when like it's always in some sci-fi somewhere where they go somewhere to mine this specific thing like they need to mine an asteroid to a belt somewhere it's like well, okay but are you gonna find anything in an asteroid that you can't find on a <laughs> planet like it's gonna be the same more stuff. of it you're gonna find maybe concentrations. More of it. There yes. is like, uh, yeah. What was it? We there was that one really big asteroid that had some crazy quadrillions of dollars of iron on it or something. Only problem is if you bring that all back to the Earth, it would be disaster. Disaster. Blair's making Blair's art. Working. Yeah. What is this one? Well, this is because this is what Garov specifically asked for. So, was the um? Is it a doormat? It's a doormat. Oh, it's square. I feel like this needs to be smaller. Like that. It's pretty. What if we? What if we do this? Oh, geez, that's not what I meant to do. we like it yeah universals that's why i mean i mean universal constants we think they're not just fudge factors we think they're constants and constant throughout the universe and science is this wonderful way of trying to get rid of the bias inherent in our human brains unfortunately we're not perfect at doing that but we do the darn best we can Eknap49 in the chat room saying, the minerals mined from uh, asteroids can be used in space, cheaper than lifting minerals out of Earth's gravity well. Very good point. Yeah. If you're going to stay in space, mm -hmm. yeah. it's good and then, to use it And in then space. you're one of the uh, uh, belters from the expanse. Belta Lauda. <laughs> Very nice. Oh, oh good guess who I had dinner with this week? Who? Ty Frank, ah. one of the authors of The Expanse. Dang. And he just hopped lovely off and wife. Like name dropping. People. I she did. Name dropping. They were just lovely. Yes. And his wife is really cool, and I hope we can get her for an interview on the show. Oh, what does she do? She studies the interaction between human humanity, humans, and their engineered environment. Huh. So I need to I need to look like have a conversation with her, sit down and see her work and see what she's working in. But the yeah. way she briefly described it, I was like, oh, I want to hear more about this. But yeah, we're having I, other conversations. Actually, but, so. but that falls into the conversation I was just sort of having, like sort of some of the universal truths. But although mm -hmm. this might be a very earthly universal truth, but if you look at the way we design cities, we have arteries for roadways and people to transport. We're like mm -hmm. the, the heme. We're like the blood vessels of the what? thing. And we have that waste turtle's removal. a great doormat. 
uh, waste removal. I mean, we've basically, our urban uh, infrastructure is very biologic based. It's the same type of systems you will find in biology, you will find in the heartbeat of a city in the way that it functions. That sounds like a that sounds like a fun talk. Yeah. If that's if that's what's uh, being studied. We have yeah, I need to find out specifically. I haven't yeah, like I said I haven't dug into it. Posting products for sale. Woohoo. <laughs> Gaurav likes the tortoise. It's a good one. <laughs> It's a good one. I like the tortoise too. I might yeah, have to the, the, um... buy myself a twist mat. <laughs> <laughs> Here, let's see. Turtle. Tortoise. Noodles is asking what the doormat is made of. Science. I can tell you in a second. Yeah, we'll find that out. As long as it's not ah. made up of hair worms, I think. Yeah, as long as it's not all hair work. Gord, if you're talking about The Expanse and you finally watched the first episode of The Expanse, yeah, the first episode also isn't even, like, the best episode. It just gets better from there. It actually took a couple of episodes for it to really get going. Then it's just amazing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the books are amazing. The books are great. So. And if you're into tabletop games, they also have a TTRPG. Really? Yes, The Expanse came out of a TTRPG. So, um, okay, you're, saying, you're, saying, you're saying letters with words? Tabletop role-playing role playing game. Does so that, you can... Is that what Dungeons & Dragons is? Is that when you have yeah. like rolling yes. dice and you have yep. like books or something that explain the game to you? Uh -huh. okay. Yeah. Yeah, so they you have can bath mats in here. Oh my god. They have black oh, they have bath oh, mats. Do they have towels? They have <laughs> definitely. They we're definitely like have that. towels. Now we're now I'm shopping. Now I am totally shopping. Yeah, what Let's do they have? They have, have. I'm no longer selling. Throw blanket. I'm now the customer. Throw blanket is very fun. Um fleece, Sherpa, serving tray, <laughs> acrylic serving tray, tray. A no, cutting it's summertime. Board. Blair, it's summertime. Maybe we need some beach towels. Yeah. I mean, it's winter in Australia, and maybe the Australians can get ready for summertime. Yeah. Okay, so let's see. So And shower curtains. Yes, Marianne. <laughs> let's see. Help create perfect feeling. Non-slip rubber is what it is. Non-slip rubber mat. Oh, Marianne, yeah, shower <laughs> curtains. Hey, <laughs> how, where's my twist mat. shower curtain? How come Check I don't out. have that? Nice. What does Brian want? Yeah, what do you want from Daniel? <laughs> <laughs> what? Okay. Yeah, what what of my art on what thing? Oh. You can think about it. Yeah. On everything, dear. Of on course. On everything, dear, said Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> right. Everything. Yeah. Uh, uh, think about it. <laughs> All right. Have fun tonight. Try can't today. think of a place where I wouldn't want to see your art, honey. It's, it's, oh. I'd like to see your art everywhere. Oh anyway, gosh, I've um, got all the right answers to these sorts yeah, of questions. Yeah, 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 yes, yeah. Um, okay, yeah. So it's acrylic. Here, let's see if they have towels. One hundred percent. Asking. Oh acrylic. wait, this isn't where I want. This is what I want. <laughs> From BB, I'm sure we could get temporary tattoos made, for sure. For sure, for sure. Congratulations. Let's now look. Accessories, office and school. Oh, a shower curtain could have a collage of Blair's art. Wouldn't that be fun? Yeah, with different oh, yeah. tiles. Towels. from like Especially from the uh, the stained glass collection. I just want. That I would want, be great. I want this. There <laughs> is a no, shower so curtain. Is, yeah, look, here's the thing. I'm going to get so ridiculous. It's going to be too much. <laughs> I'll have the shower curtain, I'll have the, the towel, and the bath mat. And I'll just be, like, themed in twists. Twist and I'll get theme. into my, my twist bed, pull up so my twist I blanket, have... lay it my head on my twist pillow. It's just your... I kind of feel like oh, that's yeah. how I want to roll. It just makes it easy. Uh, oh, I want you smaller, though. <laughs> 
Wait, wait. Anthony Becerra is saying $50. What's $50? Placements? Maybe the, maybe the shower curtain. Is it really? Oh, gosh. That's a part. Well, part of the problem with uh, Zazzle is that it's expensive. But that way, also, Kiki <laughs> doesn't have a garage full of stuff we're trying to sell. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's that was sort of the, the trade off. And I'm really bad at the I'm really really bad at the post office. So <laughs> Yeah. I don't Zaz- post office. Zazzle's well. much more reliable for sending you the thing and it's going to be more expensive than it is worth. Except that's how you get your twist. Uh Gorov, the items usually take about 24 hours to post. Oh. Maybe a little bit less. So Okay. The last time I when I did uh, the mug and shirt, my piddly <laughs> contribution to the store. Oh, that was nice. <laughs> I, actually, wasn't it? Wait, okay, wait a sec. Uh, technically, wasn't like, that Marshall? No. Wasn't his, his art that was on the twist mug? The sciency goodness. Oh no 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 not that one. No. Okay, never mind. Wait, which one? The one I had the mug, I had I think the oh. original mug, which was like the original shirt that yeah, I still those have were, somewhere. Yeah, those were old. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. And that was Marshall's, Marshall's design, the little with or the, Greg. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, those I loved the old design, which I think we found somewhere at one point, and it might shirt. still be in our Cafe Press store, which is the um, they are the Cloud Chamber Trails, which were very cute. I know. Is it warming up? Noodles <laughs> makes it harder to wear a hoodie. I hear New York is having a, a heat wave, just like the West Coast did. It was like East Coast, West Coast. Let's have heat waves, and then if you're in Detroit, you can flood. Woo! Yeah. Too damn hot. That's fun tiling. Yeah, I kind of like it. Here, check it out. Ooh. It's fancy. Check out that shower curtain. I like it. It's water themed. You go ahead and. Sew. Oh, okay. My heat wave experience. I didn't talk about my heat wave experience. It's like what I did last summer. What did I do for the heat wave? Um, oh, you got your shirt. Oh, it's a great one. It's an old one. Um. What did I do? What did I do? So last, look at that. Yeah, those have the the cloud chamber trails. It's so faded. You're muted. <laughs> so like I was saying, I like to play with my, no, uh, I have a <laughs> I'm like, what's going on there? There's like, there's like holes, holes. all throughout the shirt. Oh, you it's, need a new one. I do need a new one, but this has, yeah, the uh, cloud chamber, uh, little squiggles on it. W- wasn't it? Wasn't it, uh, Marshall that uh, did this one? Yeah. Sorry, yes, it was, and it has uh, the but, old NASA font. had this font. as a mug, also, but that that mug is long gone. Didn't last as long as my mouse pad. Indestructible. Uh, I don't know because I haven't tried it, but I hear that you can actually put out a fire. Uh, a wildfire, California wildfire, can be put out by throwing one of these onto the fire. No. And it will suppress. That's what I heard. I don't know if it's, like I said, I don't know if it's true. No, no, no. Oh, what was I going to say? So ages ago, not ages ago, yeah, ages ago, Marshall made these things, but I'll try and find them. I did find them at one point in the Cafe Press store. They were still in there. Now I have to find remem- remember how to get back into Cafe Press. Um, but, okay, this weekend, the heat wave, it was 108 on Saturday, and that was the day that we left our house and went to a friend's house uh, that had central heating and air. You don't have central air. See, this is the thing. Yeah. Why would you? It's Portland. It's Nobody Portland. We don't. It. So we had we, but we left the house with our cats in it, um, and we left it with like uh, two room air conditioners chugging along, trying to cool the upstairs of the house just to kind of keep keep it cooler. Um, and we have two ceiling fans, one in the upstairs bedroom and one downstairs 
in the living room. And then we had three additional fans running in the house to just circulate air through the house. The By Monday, which was the hottest day, the basement was 80 degrees. The, um, the bedrooms upstairs were uh, like 95, maybe up to 100. And the main floor of the house was uh, close to 90 degrees. In Portland, which is never supposed to be that. Uh, yeah. And that's what ago, that was like us using all the stuff to keep the house cool so that it would be cool when we were able to come back out cool ish and our cats would stay alive and the fish would stay alive. Um, that was with Marshall coming back at least once a day to check on on everything. Um, but we're not alone. And even there were people reporting that their apartments and their houses were well over 100 degrees on Saturday, even before the hot temperatures, the really hot temperatures got started. So there, There is a pocket of California, I have discovered, that does not heat up. Uh, it was those high triple digits a couple weeks ago here, and I took my daughters to the place that is like, you know the island where they found King Kong, and it was like surrounded by mo- uh, fog and mist? There's a little area like that along the California coast uh, from the uh, Pacifica, is it, down to Half Moon Bay. Mm-hmm. Doesn't care. It was 108 degrees here in the Central Valley. It was probably 100 degrees in San Francisco. We went down to this place called Rockaway Beach. There was yes. fog rolling over the highway as we approached. It's like, we don't care. It just doesn't matter. Microclimate. It's amazing there. Yeah. How hot did it get in Davis this oh, last weekend? Uh, this last weekend, I don't uh, I don't know. But it, 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 we've gotten into that 108, 9 degrees for days on end here already. Yeah. It's been... But it's, when, you're, uh, when you're like in a place that's hot all the time... People have air conditioners. People are, I mean, I remember living in Davis, but yeah. Yeah, so that's the thing. It's like, it's unseasonably hot here. It's breaking records. But every building constructed, every tool shed, everything, like everything has air conditioning because it's expected that that's going to be part of your existence is avoiding the sun for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Check it. Oh, Gaurav, 72. That's perfect. 72 and sunny. Oh, Alameda is a pretty nice place. I love that. I love yes. Alameda. I'm very jealous that you live there. I love a town that has its own uh, tunnel. It's got like a bat cave tunnel entrance. And a bridge. There's like there three different ways to, to get oh, onto Alameda. Then boo. Then I don't yeah. like it anymore. But it, but it used to be, am I right, that it just had you had to go through this tunnel and that was the only way to get there? I mean, it's had a mm-hmm. tunnel, or it's had a bridge as long as I've been going to Alameda, but I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I've never know. been on the bridge. I only take the tunnel. The it's, tunnel, it's awesome. yes. Hmm. Alameda's a place I would like to live. That's uh, one, of the nice one of our places. best friends lives there. We go there all the time. It's great. I like Alameda. What would happen if you made it really big? What happens if you make it? Oh. Multiples. Down, potentially. Mm, that's kind of weird. If I make it really big, it tells me that it's like not, um, it's not a, what's it called? Uh, the quality isn't it good won't, enough. Uh, okay, not a high enough resolution. Got it. Yes, thank you. My yeah, well, if, if, the, uh, if the Mad Max type apocalypse ever happens, you got two tunnels and one bridge apparently you got to take out and then you are safe from the rest of the world. Until they rediscover boats, I guess. <laughs> that's pretty funky yeah i don't know you might you know what you might have to do and i i hate to throw this on you this late at night uh but you might have to make a new piece of artwork uh tonight for to a towel not tonight <laughs> just you know just just do it right now i am there. currently like... making 13 more as we speak so <laughs> don't even worry about it <laughs> <sighs> oh, that's cute. Yeah, I think I might. I mean, we could just boy. do. I mean, I like your art. Your art's great. Something that's nice and horizontally is the yeah. best, probably. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like 
boop. Could just do the big twist logo, but that's boop. not your art. No, I, I tried it. It didn't really it's look good on beachy. the um on the beach towel, but we can try again. Maybe you can help me find the right way to do it here. Boop, twist. The fish yeah. the fish is like twist? What? Twist? Twist? There's an issue. What's the issue? The image is larger. Then it is. And you go, okay, cut it off. Uh, it's okay. Cut uh, it off. Do you have to crop it? No, Not it's... Oh, crop. yeah. It's saying, like, um... The quality is no good. Like, I can't... Uh, we need critical thinking, says, some of the worst places in California when it gets hot is when it does not cool at night. Like Red Bluff. Yeah, it wasn't cooling night at Isn't night it? here. We're in the Delta region, but there was no wind for a lot of those hot nights. Where it just was not dropping. No Delta breeze. California is a weird state, though. What? We're so big. We have, like, the Death Valley area, which has some of the hottest temperatures the United States ever experiences. And then we've got these, these areas up in the Sierras that are some of the coldest. Because they're both elevated and... Uh, to get to these these winds that come ripping through there that uh, put that wind chill factor down into the brrrr. I'm really confused about this LA news. What is the LA news? I think who is it? Michael Jobin um, <laughs> said firework explosion in South Los Angeles. Five thousand pounds of fireworks. So apparently, what I'm what I'm getting from this is that it was. The, these fireworks were illegal and they were seized hmm. from a South L.A. home. Um, but what I'm confused about is that it says the L L.A. police responded to an explosion. Hmm. And this is at the scene where they had confiscated the fireworks. But there was a planned detonation that resulted in a fireworks explosion. I'm like, is the police detonating and were they there to begin with i'm very confused very confused these are all good questions anyway big bada boom in south la people were injured that's no good it's a lot of fireworks Ooh, this looks good whoa look at you what is that it's a beach towel that is Beach awesome. <laughs> I like that one. So you're like, we'll make it. Nice. Twist beach towel. Hey, you looking for a twist beach towel? It's like every look once no in a while. It's like, look at that product. That's gonna be amazing. We've got cool beach towels. Thanks, Blair. That's awesome. I would not have done that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks like a hot beach towel. Absolutely. Yeah. But that's kind of what you want, right? When you get out of the water and you're all cold. Yeah. Like, give me something that's got some a little bit of heat to it. It'd be so, it's so cool, it's hot. It's so hot, it's cool. Or if you're going to a pool, then it doesn't matter. Yeah. All right, um, it's late o'clock in the evening. It's late o'clock. It's all right. good in the Western Front. We've all survived <sighs> another week. Making it through. I hope mm -hmm. everyone else is doing well out there. I hope everyone's doing all right. Um, nothing on... The docket, yeah, identity four, late o'clock. Um, Fourth of July this weekend, everyone. That's is a big really? holiday. Wait, how is that um, possible? Don't explode <laughs> anything, okay? Oh, gosh. Please don't. We like science, and science and chemistry, and chemistry likes flamboyant chemical interactions. But, you know, we don't want that to be influenced by climate change right now so let's think twice and be smart use our heads and let cooler thinking prevail when it comes to global warming is causing yeah. droughts and a danger of wildfire i got an idea <laughs> let's put a bunch of carbon in the air with flammable materials mm -hmm. perfect 
Yeah, don't bust out that flamethrower. Uh, yeah, it's a poor idea. <laughs> and yes, tomorrow you can flip your calendar over because it's a whole new month. We are entering the second half of this wild year, which I'm trying to think optimistically about. About the rest of the year i'm oh, going yeah. i'm trying yeah, to think good. optimistically about the rest of the year because there are things that we want to have happen people that we want to keep seeing we want to see in person things we want to do mm -hmm. right blair mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i got i got a thing or two specifically for sure a thing or that two I've, I've tried to do twice already that i would like i would like to actually get over with and and move on to the rest of my life <laughs> Identity Four just shared a really cool picture of a flamethrower in the Discord. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, let's be let's be cool, man. Let's be part of making this year a great year for everybody. Let's move it all forward. Is it time to turn it off? Time to it's close time. the show. It's time. Oh. It's time. All right. In that case. Uh, say goodnight, Blair. Goodnight, Blair. Say goodnight, Justin. Goodnight, Justin. Good, Good night, night, Kiki. Goodnight, everyone. Have a wonderful week. We hope to see you again next week. Take care. <laughs>